Why don't we look at this passage in front of us, John chapter 6, verses 15 through 21. I'll begin reading at verse 15 and read all the way up to verse 15. In other words, we'll start there and stay there. Verse 15. In John chapter 6, verse 15, John writes, Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. And so just prior to this, in John's gospel, Jesus fed 5,000 men, not including women and children, but he had fed the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. Now, as we looked at that passage as a way of reminder, that, that feeding would not have happened but for the generosity of a young boy. Remember verse 9, how it says, there's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? So this young boy gave up his lunch, is what he did. And it wasn't a large lunch by any means. Five barley loaves, two small fish. And the right question was asked, what are they among so many? But what the Lord did is the Lord took that and multiplied it, as we saw last time. You see, it's educational to consider that a small gift could be multiplied in such a way. Undoubtedly, that young boy later received a great blessing for his generosity. Proverbs 11.25 reads, The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. And so, in the provocation of this young boy's heart to be generous with the little that he had, Jesus was able to take that little, multiply it, and feed a multitude. And so that's what we were looking at last time we were together. And now we get an opportunity to see the response of the crowd, this multitude that was there. And that's what we're looking at in verse 15 when it says, Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him a king. So that's their response. They want to make him a king by force. Now, during this time, let me give you a historical context of this. There were very fierce nationalistic longings among many Jews. From around 63 B.C., the Romans ruled over Israel, and the Jewish people hated it. They saw Rome for what it was. It was a pagan nation, and the religious Jews hated having pagans ruling over them. And what they were longing for was an anointed leader who would lead them and free them from Roman oppression. Now, to understand why they were longing in this way, we need to understand their times. You see, over the centuries, Israel had been subjected to many foreign rulers. When you read your Old Testament, you see that they were invaded by Assyrians. They were invaded by and ruled by Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the Greeks, and now the Romans. And the people longed to be free from the yoke of foreign tyranny. As they had heard their prophets and read the word of God, God had made promises. One of his most treasured promises to the nation was that they would one day have one who would deliver them. One of those prophets, Jeremiah, wrote in chapter 23, verses 5 and 6, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. And so then we're looking forward during this time for this promised Messiah, this one who would rule. So over the years, by looking at the Old Testament, they had a basic set of expectations concerning Messiah. And Jesus seemed to fit those expectations. They had said that before Messiah would arrive, there would be a time of terrible tribulation. And they felt that under the Roman rulership, that they were under such pressure. There would be a forerunner who uh, would be sent, who would be like Elijah. And after this, Messiah would appear and establish his kingdom. The unbelieving nations would ally to fight against Messiah. The nations opposing Messiah would be destroyed for their opposition. Jerusalem would be restored and be the city of the great king. The Jews would be scattered throughout the earth, but would be regathered to Israel. Israel would become the center of the world. All nations would be subject to Messiah, 
And after Messiah began to rule, the world would enter into eternal peace and joy. And they're looking for this one who's going to come and deliver. And as far as they could see, Jesus fit this messianic expectation. And so as Jesus has done what he has done up to this point, they wanted to use him to gain their liberty from Roman oppression. Now, on Jesus' part, he recognized this as a hindrance to his mission of salvation. He saw this really as a temptation from the enemy. He was being offered the kingdom without the cross. Again, notice verse 15. They wanted to take him by force to make him king. And once again, the kingdom is being offered to him without a cross. And that's simply a variation of a temptation he'd already been faced with. Remember in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 4, verses 5 through 8, Luke had recorded that the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. If you're asking me to worship you, you also know I have to serve you. No, I will not do that. I will not take a kingdom without the cross. And so his response to what's taking place at this time, where they're wanting to take him and make him king, according to verse 15, is he departed. He departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Now, the other gospel writers give us insight into what was taking place. And let me give to you uh, a couple of things. Matthew gives us insight in Matthew 14, 22 and 23. It says, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat, go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. So Matthew tells us that he made his disciples get into the boat. That word made means to uh, compel or to drive, to strongly urge or constrain. Jesus made them. They, they didn't want to, but he made them do this. There are at least three reasons that he compelled them to leave. One, his apostles may have feared for his safety and wouldn't leave him alone. Recently, he had received death threats. They may have been concerned for him. Jesus had healed a crippled man on the Sabbath, and he had said, God is my father. And according to John 5, 18, for this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So they may have feared for his safety. They didn't want to leave him alone, so he compelled them. He made them go. Second, Herod was growing more interested in Jesus and began to pose a threat to him. You see, this Herod governed over Galilee. This is the one who beheaded John. This is the one who later will interview Jesus before his crucifixion. And Herod was curious concerning who Jesus was, according to Luke, chapter 9, verses 7 through 9. It reads, Herod the Tetrarch heard all about uh, all that was going on. And he was perplexed because some were saying that John had been raised from the dead, others that Elijah had appeared, still others that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. But Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this I hear, so, I hear such things about? And he tried to see him. And so Herod was beginning to pose a threat. And then third, it is possible that they were in danger of being influenced by the multitude. If there's anything that the church is, it is influenced by the multitude. The church will listen to the words of even the world to its own hurt. They will. There are Christians who will listen to the words of the world and ignore the words of Scripture. I have one friend in particular who, who likes to post things on Facebook. And I've known him since we were less than 10 years old. And he will post the dumbest things. And he claims to be a believer. I have no reason to think he's not one. But every once in a while, just to get him irritated, I know it's not right, but I've known him a long time, I, I will say, I will write something to him, and oh, he gets so mad, and, and, he, and he's got a whole posse behind him, then they get mad too, and so it's rather fun um, to, 
post things for him because he he is avid in his political beliefs to the point where I just enjoy upsetting the apple cart with him once in a while. And um, but the whole thing is, is he will make comments that are just biblically untrue, and he'll make comments that need to be corrected, and and I will I will kind of post some things for him to get him to think about it and all, because he's a believer, but he has been influenced by the world. And, and listen very carefully to this. I'll say it briefly, but if you're not reading the word of God, I guarantee you, you are being influenced by the world too. You are. Somebody once said, you Christians are brainwashed. And I agreed with that. I still do. I am. I'm brainwashed. You see, my brains were dirty, and they needed to be washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. So if you want to say I'm brainwashed, I'm brainwashed. I'm, I'm blood washed. That's what I am. Uh, again, without uh, taking too much time to say this, you know, prior to coming to Christ, I was, a, I was an extremely, what is today being referred to as a liberal, uh, I was extremely liberal. I, extremely liberal, you know, hated, hated the police, hated government, you know, I was a hippie, you know, I hated, I hated, I hated the, the, um, the conservatives, I, I thought they were, they were just morons, you know, and, and I really was extremely, extremely liberal, and, and I became conservative, not as a political choice, but as a, a believer, I started reading the Bible, and as I read the Bible, I started seeing my opinion about this. I think this is okay. I started reading the Bible, and then I started seeing so much where God said, no, that's not okay. So over time, these dirty brains were washed by the blood of Christ. And in reading the Word of God, my liberal persuasion was reduced to more of a biblical view, a biblical worldview. I don't like to refer to myself by progressive, liberal, conservative. I don't like to box myself in that way. But I do know this, compared to how I thought as a young person, I don't think anything like that now. And it isn't because I'm just an older man. It's because I've been reading God's word for many years. And in reading God's word, his blood has washed my dirty brains. And I've become somebody that holds fast to what I see Scripture has to say. Because you and I, we, can be influenced by the multitudes. And what's interesting about that, I'll take a second point and uh, move on, is the multitudes sometimes can include your friends who don't read the Word, don't attend a church fellowship, don't serve in any ministries, just our Christians in name only. And they very often are influencers of you too. And you can feel harsh and even judgmental and unloving because you hold fast to some things that they refuse to hold fast to. I'm not saying to judge them, but I am saying be aware of that. Because if you want to grow in your faith, you need to be, you need to be evenly yoked with people who have the same desire. So you can spur one another on to love and good works and move forward in the things of God. And to begin to view your friends who are walking in a carnal fashion, not with a judgmental, harsh heart, but to see them as ministry. Because they can't be, they can't be experiencing the joy of the Lord, the love of God, the peace of God, as long as they're in rebellion to him. And that's why you love them. That's why you tell them the truth. That's why you encourage them. Because either you're influencing or you're being influenced. And I made a choice. I'm going to be the influencer. And I want to influence through God's word by God's Holy Spirit. And so these, uh, these people were in danger of being influenced by the multitude. You see, the crowd had decided that they wanted to crown Jesus their king. And so what does Jesus do? Well, he orders them to leave, saving them from the world's concept of rule. You see, Jesus didn't come to establish a system that was patterned after the world. In Matthew 20, verse 25, Matthew records that Jesus called them to himself and said, 
you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. You see, Jesus didn't pattern his kingdom after the world. It's been said that he rules an upside-down kingdom where greatness is measured by service. In Mark 10, 44, he said, whoever wants to be first must be servant of all. In Matthew 20, 27 and 28, whoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant, even as the Son of Man came, not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Today, we, we look sometimes, and I'll say it, I can speak of it as a pastor. Sometimes we, we look at the pastor like he's the most important person in the group. He's the chief servant. I don't mind being recognized at that. I want to be looked at as being someone who's a servant of the Lord and a servant to you. That's what I am as a pastor. But sometimes pastors may forget what they're supposed to be. And before you know it, they're being treated like royalty when in fact they're servants. And that's what Jesus taught us. He said he didn't come to, to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. You see, man's kingdoms can only be material and carnal but not so with the kingdom of God. In Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so in Matthew 14, 23, Matthew tells us that he sent the disciples and the multitude away, and he prayed. He prayed because he was committed to his Father's will. In John 5, 19, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself, he can do only what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. And it is most likely that he was praying for his disciples. That was his habit. In John 17, 9, he said, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And so he was praying. Now, as this is taking place, verse 16, when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea and got into the boat and went over the sea toward Capernaum. It was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. But he said to them, Boo! Now he said to them, <laughs> It is I. Don't be afraid. They willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. So we'll pick up and continue this. I'm going to piece together some things to get a more full account of what is occurring. Jesus has compelled his disciples to enter a boat, and they've begun to cross the Sea of Galilee. It says in verses 16 and 17, when evening come, came, his disciples went to the sea. So the disciples are in Bethsaida. It's a village that is to the northeast of the Sea of Galilee, if you were looking at a map. They went into the sea. They entered into a boat. They're traveling now. Uh, it would more than, like, more than likely be from the east, and now they're traveling to the west, and they're on their way to a seaport called Capernaum. Uh, according to verse 17, I'm piecing this together for you, it's evening. It's what is really referred to as second evening. And second evening is uh, from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock in the evening. John tells us that it's already dark. Now notice again, verse 18, how it says, The sea arose because a great wind was blowing. So these are storm conditions that we're talking about here. Verse 19 tells us that they had rowed about three or four miles. And they saw Jesus walking on the sea, drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. So, Matthew, when you begin to piece together the various accounts, the Gospel of Matthew tells us what time it is when Jesus arrives on the scene. According to Matthew 14, 25, it is the fourth watch of the night. That means when you're looking at the watches as they were broken down, it's between 3 and 6 o'clock in the morning. The wind had kept pushing them into the middle of the lake is what had taken place. And at this time, they had been battling the wind and the sea for around nine hours. 
So you don't see that when you're reading this. You have to piece together the various Gospels. So they've been going. We've already seen that it was between 3 and 6 a.m. We know that they had left earlier. And when you begin to look at that, it's close to nine hours that they've been battling the sea. They're tired. They're frustrated. They're helpless. They're alone. And under those conditions, all of us have the same propensity to begin to cry to God. We'll cry out to the Lord for help. Psalm 38, verse 9, Lord, all my desire is before you. My groaning is not hid from you. And you're, you're, in, you're having a tough time. I'm having a tough time. I just pray. And I say, God, help me. God, be with me. I don't know what to do. And under these conditions, and we have to put ourselves in that conditions, they've been moving against the, the wind for, for hours. And, and they're concerned. They're not making really any headway. They're, it's only a few miles from one point to the other, and it's been taking them hours, and they haven't gotten there. So all of this is taking place as windy conditions, and it's, it's, it's causing them great concern. As all of this is taking place, it says in verse 19, they rode about three or four miles. They saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid, and who wouldn't be? I mean, who here would expect to see somebody taking a walk? On the sea. I mean, <laughs> of course not. When it says they saw, the word saw there uh, speaks to look intently or to transfix. They, they were staring at him. Now, they might have been asking, where is God when you need him? Have you ever done that? Have you ever wondered, God, where are you? How come you're not helping me? I have many times. Psalm 13, verse 1, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Have you ever been there? You get in a, in, in a situation you cannot extricate yourself from, and you're tired, and you're alone, and you're upset. Well, they're about to learn a lesson. They're going to learn that they haven't been abandoned by him. Mark makes it clear that Jesus was aware of their situation. In Mark 6, 48, he saw them toiling in rowing. The wind was contrary to them. He saw them. He was aware of their toil. Don't think that God is not aware of yours. Because sometimes you do. Sometimes I do. God, where are you? Don't you see this? God, where are you? Can't you hear me? Why don't you answer me? What have I done? Why, is, why does it seem that the heavens are brass and my words are just falling to the earth with no effect? Oh, God, how long? How long are you going to allow my enemies to triumph over me? How long am I going to have to cry to you for help? And it seems that you just don't. How many times have you prayed for a loved one? Maybe a kid that's giving you problems. Maybe a neighborhood problem that you're having. Maybe a problem on the job. Maybe there's somebody you work with that is such a difficult person to work with that you've gotten to the point you just don't want to work there anymore. Or maybe your mom. Maybe your dad. Maybe your brother or sister. Maybe a husband or wife. And, and it feels like no matter what you do, nothing changes. And, and then you say, well, you know, I've read the Bible, and the Bible says, call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. God, you told me to call unto you, and I am. But it doesn't seem as if you're hearing me. And as I'm going through this storm in my life, as I'm battling these things with such intensity and such pain and such pathos, Lord, I don't know what to do anymore. I don't, have, I don't know what to do. And you put your face on the ground, the carpet in your bedroom, and you cry out to God, and you say, God, be merciful to me. I don't know what to do. I'm in the middle of a storm, and I don't know what to do. We, we had been renting a, a church building on Vine Street in Ontario. We had started the church in a house, and... and um, it, it, it out the, the study outgrew the, the home. So we found a little place called 
uh, Church of God Seventh Day on Vine Street in Ontario. And we started to use that, I think, in, like in September. And, uh, you know, we had 45 people or so. It went to about 60 people. And, um, and then the people who were renting this little building to us kicked us out because they said that we were a cult because we worshipped on Christmas Day. And uh, turns out they were a cult. We didn't know it. They were a cult. So they kicked us out. And I told us, you need to find a place. And you have until the end of January. My then assistant, whose name was Dan, and one who was helping in ministry, Randy Walls, who's now the pastor of Upland, and Dan Pastors in Clay Allen, Washington. And I went looking through the entire city of Ontario. I could tell you every empty, vacant building because we went through almost all of them through Ontario looking for a place. Couldn't find one. And it was in the middle of January. And we only had two weeks and we were going to have to leave. And I, I was a, it was a Wednesday night. And I, I, I went into my bedroom and Marie, my wife, and, and my kids were gone. I don't know where they had gone, but I was alone, and that gave me opportunity to go into my, into my bedroom, and I still remember it, and it, I, I placed my face on the ground, on the carpet. I just laid there and wept before God and said, Father, we've only got 60 people, but they're the most dear 60 people in my life, and I don't know what to do. God, I've looked, and I can't find a place, Lord Jesus, in your name I pray. Us. And I remember going to the Wednesday Bible study at David and Connie Sines's, and I walked into the front room, and, and a woman named uh, Karen looked at me, and she said, you look like death warmed over. That was her greeting as I walked in, and you look like death warmed over. And I said, well, thanks for the compliment. You're ugly, too. No, um, <laughs> she said, we need to pray for you. And I said, yes, please. And so after the Bible study, Dan and I, were. we sat in a chair and the small group of people, 30 people or so, that were at the study, laid hands on us and prayed, God, do something. And I went home that night, still carrying that burden. I put my head on my pillow. And as I did so, I heard the voice of the Lord in an audible way say, you will need a building large enough to seat 200 on Easter Sunday. And I remember it was a voice I heard, and, and I said, that's true. And the next day, it was uh, a Thursday, I was preparing my Bible study for Sunday, John 12, 24, unless a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it will bring forth much fruit. And I remember closing my Bible, saying to the Lord, I am dead. I am dead, Jesus. And then the mailman came up carrying our, our mail. And the voice of the Lord spoke a second time and said, your letter is here. Because I had written Pastor Chuck a week before. And I explained to him who I was. I explained to him what we were doing. And I said, I would like to be associated with Calvary Chapel. And uh, he wrote us a letter. It's there in the hallway at in the main sanctuary. And it says, welcome to Calvary Chapel. And so, the voice of the Lord had said to me, as I was there, your letter is here. And I went and got that. I read it, and Chuck was, a, was welcoming us in. And that following Saturday we, had a, Saturday, we had a breakfast. And at the breakfast, I said to the people, you know, we're going to change our name from Ontario Christian Chapel, because that's what our incorporated name was. We're changing our name from Ontario Christian Chapel to Calvary Chapel of Ontario. And from that point on, the Lord began to add. And so we got an extension. We were supposed to leave in January, but the church that we were renting from extended us for two months. And then on Easter Sunday, pouring rain, that's when I went out there. And I said, you don't know this. But I told 200 people, I said, you're here. But the Lord told me you would be here. And that's how it works, guys, in the kingdom of God. 
That's how it works. You keep your eyes on the Lord. He hasn't forgotten you. He knows what you need. He knows what will glorify him. And he will answer in his time. And if it's something that brings him glory, he's going to answer in a way that it does. He hasn't abandoned you. He hasn't forgotten you. He's not leaving you behind. He's not blessing other people and wanting to hurt you by blessing others. It's in his time. He makes all things beautiful in his time. And his time is always perfect. And he always does the right thing. And we need to understand that. He does not abandon us. Again, Mark 6, 48, he saw them toiling and rowing. The wind was contrary, but he hadn't forgotten them. His eyes were upon them, even when they did not know it. Verse 19 says, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat. They were afraid. When it says they saw Jesus, that word saw in the Greek speaks to look intently. Again, to transfix or to stare. They saw him. Their eyes were locked on him. But in storm conditions, they weren't able to really recognize him. Mark 6, 48 gives us insight. Mark says that he was walking on the sea and would have passed them by. So it seemed as if Jesus was about to walk past them. And that was already horrifying to them. Because when they saw this, well, Matthew tells us they thought they were seeing a ghost. In Matthew 14, 26 and 27, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled. They said, it's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, boo. No, saying, be of good cheer. Trick or treat, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Now, their belief that it was a ghost was a common thing during that time. You, you even see this again later on after Jesus has been resurrected and appeared to them. In Luke 24, 36 through 39, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. They were terrified and frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. He said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Handle me. See, a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. Well, John 6, 20 says, He said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Now in Matthew, Matthew gives more details of what Jesus said. Matthew 14, 27 says, Immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. Someone said it was more important to still the storms of their hearts first. And that's what he did. He calmed them down. And Matthew adds details that were not revealed in John's gospel. If you take notes, Matthew 14, 28 and 29, Matthew says, Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Peter was overjoyed. His fears were overcome by Jesus' presence. Think about that. Like I told you recently, every time we go on the Sea of Galilee, they will stop that boat and they will say, anybody want to take a walk? They always do that. Want to take a walk? And uh, I've lost three or four friends. <laughs> no. Command that I should walk out on that water. The Apostle Peter is somebody that I admire a lot. You got to picture it for a moment, and we'll be looking at this in some detail, but Peter steps out of that boat. And it, it's in, in storm-type conditions, and he's walking, and he climbs out, and he, he begins to walk. And, and it, it's like when Jesus says, well, well come here, uh, in a sense, 
Peter is saying, it's safer to be with you than remain in this boat. And so Jesus says, well, come. Come to where it's safe. Come with me. And he grants that request. And, 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 and it reveals something about the apostle. It reveals a strong faith. And it could serve to bring humility to this bold apostle in him doing so. But what we see is he steps out of the boat. Now think about it. I, it's hard. See, I, I, can't, I can't paint this picture. What would you feel like if you stepped out on this troubled sea and discovered that the minute you put your foot on that water, it was like concrete. My mind reels at that. I, I, can't, I cannot picture that. I think that I can actually do dishonor to the passage if I don't at least think aloud about that for a moment for us. Because sometimes you read the miracles of Christ and you don't put yourself in that. If I were in a boat, the boat is rocking, I'm concerned. As I'm concerned, I see someone taking a walk on the water. and I, It's a spirit. Oh, my. What's going on? Um, Jesus. Oh, Peter says, it's, it's Jesus. And you got the other guys with him. Oh, well, if it is you, command that I should come to you. You got to almost hear the guys. Do it, Peter. Go for it, man. You can do it. I know you can do it. And Judas is saying, you want to bet? You know, <laughs> you can do it. You know, let's face it. The church is filled with people sitting in boats. Well, once in a while, somebody walks on water. That's a fact. You know, why didn't the other guys do that? Why didn't they all do it? Think about it. They could have. Why the apostle Peter and nobody else? Have you ever asked yourself that? Why him and not me? Why her and not me? Lord, how come you use them and not me? Maybe we're just sitting in the boat. <laughs> Maybe we're better cheerleaders than water walkers. Do you like sitting on the bench? I never did. I never did. I never wanted to have my glove, plain ball, and sit on the bench. I was not a good bench warmer. I wasn't. I wanted to put on my uniform and I wanted to dirty it. I wanted to slide into second. I wanted to slide against the grass cat. I wanted to play. I have never been the guy who can sit the bench. I don't want to just wear the uniform. I want to dirty it. I want to play hard. I want to rip the knees. I want to knock somebody down. That's how I played ball. That's how a lot of us do. I was, dirty, I was a dirty player. That's a fact. I'm going to knock somebody down. I played ball for a long time. I, my first ministry in the church, besides teaching Bible studies, was playing softball. I played softball into my 30s. I played a lot, and, I was, and I'll say it truthfully, I was good. I was a good ball player. I was. I liked it. That was something I, I played ball all the time. All the time. I loved it. I loved it. But I never wanted to sit the bench. I didn't want to wear a uniform that didn't get dirty. Do you? Do you want to be the person who just wears the uniform, sits there, gets a snow cone after the game? <laughs> the only stains you ever get is from the cherry, from the snow cone. That... <laughs> Don't be a bench warmer. The other 11 are sitting in there. You can do it. We know you can do it. And Peter's saying, you know, get up there. Peter's saying, can I? yes, come on, follow me. And Judas is saying, I'm taking bets, you know, five to one. You know, that's what's taking place. That's what's taking place. And Peter steps out of the boat. He had to have been amazed when his feet hit water and it was concrete. Can you imagine that? His feet hit water, and it was concrete. And he starts to t put yourself there. Nine hours of trying to get across. Storm conditions. You see what you think is an apparition. This is a ghost. It's a ghost. No, it's not. It's Jesus. If it is you, then command me that I should walk on water. The others are kind of just sitting there. Well, 
There goes that big mouth. Come. Can you see him climbing over the side? Can you see him as he's putting his foot down? And Jesus is standing. Can you see him? And Jesus is standing there. <laughs> you can do it, Peter. You can do it. And he walks. And he walks. He's doing the impossible. But with God, all things are possible. He wasn't alone. And neither are you. And there are things in your life that you think are impossible. It's water walking. You just don't realize it yet. And you're not walking alone. You're walking towards someone. Keep that in mind. And he's got his eyes on you. And he's not going to let you fall. He's watching you. You can sit in the boat if you want to. But I never wanted to sit in a bench. I wanted the dirty uniform. I wanted to play. I wanted to compete. I wanted to be part of the team. I didn't want to sit a bench. And neither, neither did the Apostle Peter. He wanted to take a walk with Jesus. His amazement gave way to reality. He was walking on water. And that caused him to look around <laughs> and to see the conditions. Matthew 14, 30 and 31 says, When he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, I, well, wait a minute, Jesus. Why are you, why are you getting mad at him? There are 11 chumps sitting in a boat. <laughs> They're not doing anything. They're not doing anything. You see, somebody said his face, his faith was enough to get him out of the boat, but not enough to keep him from sinking. Lord, he cries out, save me. And Jesus' response, according to Matthew, is a question. Why did you doubt? What is the answer? My answer would be I doubted because I only believe what I can see and I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. So with that said, let me give you four things. If you take notes, you might want to put these things down on paper. Four applications to our own lives from this miracle. First, Jesus sent them into the storm. Jesus sent them into the storm. He compelled them to get into the boat and to leave. Jesus sent them into the storm. There are storms that we will be sent into because in the storm our faith is refined and we learn to trust in the one who delivers us out of the storm. He will send you sometimes into a place where all you're going to do is learn to trust him. Are you there? Some of you are right now. And you're saying, why the storm? It's so that you can see him and him alone. You will be put into places. My whole Christian life has been a series of one storm after another. One storm after another. I've almost drowned on a few occasions, and I know what it's like to have your head go underwater and to panic with such a fear and you fight to get your head out of that water again. And you take their breath only for a wave to knock you down. And you go back down again. And you get to the point where you're so exhausted you just don't know what to do. I've been there, have you? And life can be that way too. And there are times that the Lord has actually led me into a storm. So that my faith would be refined and I would learn to trust in him alone. I couldn't get myself out, but he delivered me. And that's a lesson you will learn as a believer. Don't complain against God. Second, as he had sent them into the storm, he was praying for them. He was watching over them. He was aware of their danger. So God doesn't slumber, nor does he sleep. He's always vigilant. He's aware. Psalm 121, 3 and 4, He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. 
Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. In Matthew 6, verse 8, Jesus simply said, your father knows what you need before you ask him. He's already aware. So he, pray, he was praying for them, watching over them, was aware of them, because he knows what you need. And then he taught them to trust him and to have faith in him. This was a lesson to teach all of them to put their trust in him. Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear not, for I'm with you. Be not dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So trust in me. And then he evoked worship from them because ultimately what they said to him was truly you are the son of God. Mark tells us in chapter 6, verse 52, they did not consider the miracle of the loaves. Their heart was hardened. In other words, they had missed the point of the feeding. Jesus does abundantly above all we ask or think. I started a Bible study. I started a Bible study in September of 1973. I was one month past my 23rd birthday. My first Bible study victims were my mom and my dad, <laughs> sisters, and a couple of neighbors. And I sat them in the front room, and actually the den at my parents' house, 1973. Is that for me? <laughs> 1973. They were my victims. In 1974, I started a home Bible study in Ontario at my brother's house. Just past Mission in San Antonio by the park. My brother had some friends from work, and they came to work. They came from work to the Bible study. John John, who usually does our bulletin, John John, his parents came to my Bible study. I met John John when he was six years old. His mother baked Marie and my wedding cake. They were very close to us, very dear to us. And John, his daddy John, and Annie came to our Bible study. And it was a handful of people. Ten people, eleven people. And over the, over the years, started a Bible study in, another, in a church, Calvary Chapel Claremont. Never had more than 40 people in that Bible study, and it was a church Bible study. And we started a home study at David and Connie's Sciences. 20 people, 15, 20, 30 people, started a church with 25 adults, about 5 to 10 kids. Do you think that I thought that the Lord one day would give us what we have? If you are faithful in that which is least, you will also be faithful in that which is much. If you put your hand to the plow and you just go straight and let God do the work as you stay faithful to him, you'll be surprised at what he'll do with a willing life. Sometimes I wonder how many blessings I didn't even cash that God had given me checks for. Sometimes I wonder where I've made mistakes and not been in the center of his will to receive his blessings the way he wanted to bless because he wants to do more... He wants to do things abundantly above all you can ask or think. He wants to bless your life. He wants to, he wants to change. He wants to provide. He wants to care. And he wrestles with us so much to convince us of that, doesn't he? And he says, you know, you can do the impossible if I'm with you. Don't take your eyes off me. You see, the apostle Peter took his eyes off Jesus and saw the waves and the wind. And when you take your eyes off the one who keeps you stable and you look at the things that make you unstable, you will be unstable. 
But when you keep your eyes on him, when you're locked on him, when you're trusting him, when you know he will not, he didn't raise you up to let you down. He didn't save you to hurt you. He saved you because he loves you. And he'll care for you and provide for you. I can't tell you the stories. There's so many of how God has in the last moment just made a way. So he would ask, why did you doubt? You were walking on water because I made it so. You saw the waves and you felt the wind. And you trusted in that more than you trusted in me. And all that was was a distraction. The natural things that draw your attention from me. How many natural things do we have that draw our attention from him? He says, keep your eyes on me. And you can do the impossible. You will blow your mind at what he can do. And he can do things so beyond, so beyond what you would ever imagine. So beyond that. God is good. God loves us. And he wanted the apostle to know that. Trust in him. I am with you, he says. And then we do call him the son of God. We worship him. Mark 6, 6, 52 says they considered not the miracle of the loaves. Their heart, were, their heart was hardened. They had missed the point of the feeding. Jesus provides. Well, finally, we'll close with verse 21. They willingly received him into the boat. Immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. When he entered into the boat, they arrived at the destination. It would seem that even in the midst of the storm, they had been being drawn near to the shore. You see, when you are when you're with him, you will definitely arrive at safe harbor. Psalm 107, 28 through 30. They cry out to the Lord in their trouble. He brings them out of their distresses. He calms the storm so that its waves are still. Then they are glad because they're quiet. And he guides them to their desired haven the things that you're going through, if you begin to realize that those are certain things that are in your way that are going to help you to arrive at where you want to be, you'll begin to look at your circumstances differently. All things work together for the good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. The things that I've gone through are the things that made me into the man that I am today. Somebody asked me once, if there was anything you could change in your Christian life, what is it that you would change? And my answer was quick and it was simple. I wouldn't change a thing. Because everything I've gone through up to this point has made me who I am. And I want to be a man who has learned his lessons and has become someone who trusts God. So even in the things that I've gone through that at that time brought, brought great pain or disappointment or whatever, were necessary because God takes the bitter and he mixes it with the sweet and he produces who you are. And you can look back over your life as I can now after all of these years of walking with him and I can say he's good. He is good. He has, oh, abundantly above all I can ask or think. He has never left me. He has never forsaken me. He has always been faithful to me because I have finally begun to realize he loves me and he loves you too. Don't ever forget that.